we are so adaptable people that these times have done what is done is just kind of emphasize how good of out of the box thinker we are welcome to a special episode of the hummingbird i'm your guest host fernando Albertorio. i hope you our listener are doing well staying healthy and safe in this special episode we are having conversations with experts, leaders, and advocates within the blind and low vision community to learn about their careers, goals, and accomplishments. Our guests will share their experience and learnings so we could all live successfully and cope with our new normal with COVID-19. Our show is brought to you by Sunu, makers of the Sunu Band smartwatch. Visit sunu.com to learn more. I'm here with Carmen Camacho. Carmen is a health professional, an advocate for persons with rare diseases. She's a member of the board of directors of the HPS uh, Global Network uh, and has been working uh, in the health field, uh, healthcare field for many years. Carmen, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show. You know, I've known you for many years, uh, yeah. especially as an advocate. Uh, and involved with your work uh, within the albinism and low vision community. Uh, I was wondering, can you please share a little bit more about who you are and what you do with, uh, with the audience? Sure. My name is, uh, you said, Carmen Camacho. I am originally from Puerto Rico, came to the States to do my uh, master's in psych by psychobiology, uh, which I finished in uh, SUNY Binghamton. Uh, and after that, got married and worked in the um, social services community for a while. Um, for many years was a crisis worker, crisis uh, clinician in the emergency room until I moved to Massachusetts where I was given the opportunity to work with um, um, the Latino community as a, a Latino uh, mental health clinician. Uh, so I, have, I work in a clinic right now, private practice. Um, but my heart, it's been always working with the, uh, low vision, albinism, hermansky putlak syndrome community. Um, I've been involved with the HPS network for over 27 years. Wow. The age of my son. Mm -hmm. So wow. I've been working with them part as a member. And then a few years after that, I started being uh, involved with the uh, board, um, the board of directors. And in the last five years, I've been very uh, working very closely with people with uh, lung disease. As I will talk later, uh, people with HPS develop uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, I am uh, very involved with families through the process of lung transplant, mm -hmm. either deciding if they want to have a lung transplant and going through the process of how to get connected to the um, transplant centers or even to the process of saying no i don't want a lung transplant and doing hospice and end up leaving planning so pretty pretty intense work wow so you've been involved for many years in the healthcare profession also in, in advocacy, advocacy work, work. And education mm -hmm. and also edu education and activation around people with rare diseases or rare conditions like albinism and, and some of the other conditions that we'll talk about in a bit um, in your work. And, and here's how I met uh, Carmen is that we met uh, through an event from the albinism uh, uh, community and group here in Massachusetts called the HPS Network. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the HPS Network? What it, What is the network and the mission? Well, sure. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you what HPS is. HPS are the uh, letters for hermansky putlak syndrome, which is a lot of words. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's uh, HPS is a rare type of albinism. It's a condition that has people with albinism. Not everybody with albinism has HPS, but all the people with HPS have albinism. So we are a type of albinism. And uh, people with HPS develop, um, we have the regular albinism characteristics. We have the, the skin you know, uh, condition, the skin light condition where we're very 
so, um, susceptible to sun and to skin cancer. So we have to be very careful. Uh, people with albinism and HPS have um, the low vision. So our community is usually 2200. So we're legally blind. So some of us have a little bit more vision, but still considered low vision. Mm -hmm. um, we develop the most important, oh, we have a bleeding disorder. So people with HPS, which is actually the diagnosis for HPS comes from missing the dense bodies in your platelets. So all the people with HPS have um, uh, bleeding dysfunction. So we don't clot. Um, so that's in its own is pretty sensitive. We have to make sure that we don't, people with uh, HPS don't take any aspirin or anything that would make bleeding worst and because we have different types of, of HPS we have 10 subtypes so far HPS 1 2 and 4 develop pulmonary fibrosis a hundred percent of the time we don't know why we're trying to figure that out so people with HPS uh, with those subtypes will only be uh, treated with uh, a lung transplant. That's the only cure. They, their treatments, their things to slow down the progression, but ultimately the only way that you can survive is with a lung transplant. So that said, so people understand what HPS is, our ultimate goal is to find a cure. So, um, you know, we're both from Puerto Rico. Uh, in fact, we're both from the same hometown of Ponce, right? Yes. Uh, and I remember when I arrived to NIH, the National Institutes of Health, in Bethesda, Maryland, back in uh, well, 1999, so I'm dating myself here, um, I met uh, Bill Gull, who was one of the leading researchers in, in, in HPS. And, and unknowing to me, I, I didn't know about the HPS network at that time, uh, but Bill pretty much followed me around the hospital, and I was like, why is this guy following me? <laughs> and uh, he reached my office and, and said, you know, you work here? And I'm like, yes, I do. And he's like, great, I need to talk to you. And that's how I got involved in the study uh, back in uh, 2000 and, and uh, up to 2001. I, I, did, uh, I was uh, one, of, one of his uh, test subjects or, or participants in the study. Yeah, we, had, um, we were very lucky to have uh, Donna Pell, who's our founder. Mm -hmm. And Donna had Ashley. And Ashley is at NIH is K0. Mm -hmm. So Ashley had a really bad bleeding episode when she was like two years old to the point that she even had traumatic brain injury wow. because of the bleeding. And she got so frustrated and it was, she was so alone that she felt that no one ever had to go through this by itself, by himself. And she started getting people together and she was how that's how she founded the HPS network. She started gathering people, looking for people, and she needed people because she needed Dr. Gall to be interested in finding a cure for this. So doc, uh, thanks to Donna's efforts, uh, we were able to start the national, which is what you're talking about, the natural history study at, at the National Institute of Health, which I also start, um, when on night in 1990, uh, let's see, 19, no, I went in uh, 90. I, that's when I went, 1990. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's uh, how we started that, that process, trying to figure out how, looking at Ashley and looking at the few people that at that time we knew had HPS to see what the progression of the condition was. So. And the HPS network also produced a, a documentary film about the about yeah. about Ashi's story and and um, and, and the first uh, initial studies. Mm -hmm. It's called Rare, Rare, yes. Yeah. And we, if anyone want to see Rare, uh, they can contact the office, the HPS network at uh, uh, one eight hundred seven eight nine nine HPS, and they'll be able to get them in touch. Uh, get them the uh, documentary, because it's very interesting and it's how a patient advocacy group like us, the little patient advocacy group, um, really move along the science and started working in conjunction with scientists to find 
work together to find a cure. So it's not only the scientists in the bench, but the patients and um, the involvement between the two of them, how they get things moving. But now the network has grown. It's so much has changed uh, over the years. Yes. Um, you have now turned into a very uh, leading group, a leader in, in advocacy for rare diseases. Tell me where the network is right now. Well, we have been very lucky. It took us 27 years. Like it, it didn't happen overnight, but our, our efforts had gone, um, you know, that we are very involved with uh, a lot of the research community, the scientific community, and we're getting um, ourselves in a place where people know that we are hardworking and respected and knowledgeable about the, the, what HPS is and the what's involved with HPS. Um, we went from having one conference in somebody's basement for uh, to a conference that we do every every year in Long Island. And the last time we had last year, we hosted 40 doctors that came for a whole for a whole day what we to what we call the meeting of the minds. And in the meeting of the minds, these doctors are supposed to come in and talk about their research, and it has to be unpublished research. So it has to be brand new, just cutting edge, whatever they're doing about HPS or HPS-related things. It's kind of like a Gordon Conference-style research where the, mm -hmm. the researchers are bringing in anything that's unpublished. It's basically all the cutting-edge work that's happening. Yes. So we came from doing that with five people to last year we have 42. Wow. And with this year, we were supposed to have our conference in um, March. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to cancel it. And actually this weekend, we were supposed to be flying to Puerto Rico to have our conference in Puerto Rico, where we meet two days. One day we meet with the patients and one day we meet with doctors and the doctors get CMEs that we sponsor so they can learn the clinical aspects of HPS. And that actually is a great, uh, leads me into now the question of our new normal, you know, living with COVID-19, coronavirus, and, and again, the high risk mm -hmm. that patients with HPS have, uh, whether in Puerto Rico or across the United States, um, are, are having, especially coping with, uh, with the risks of getting exposed to coronavirus right now. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about how the network has uh, evolved uh, um, and adjusted to providing uh, and leading during this time. Um, yeah. Well, we were, you know, it, I think we were talking about this before we started the program is how people with low vision had always had to rely on technology to make our lives better. So we were kind of like three steps ahead to the rest of the world and um, being ready for this which, you know, it's, I guess it's worked to our advantage. Um, so we are, we were always very involved with the community um, by our presence in, in, through conferences, through outreach, and that had to stop, of course, because of the uh, social distancing. And um, we are there, we, we answer questions, we support them. So we are already, we're doing that. We have a phone, uh, phone um, connections, parent connection every Monday at eight in Spanish and the second Monday of the month in English. Mm. And we were also already having what we called um, a, an adult connection the second Wednesday of the month for people that spoke from people in Puerto Rico mm. um, in Spanish. So the problem with the virus is that we had to extend that to our whole community. So we've been offering much more video conferencing where we all get together and at least get to see each other and talk. So there were so many things we wanted to tell our people. So we're trying to do it through video conferencing, through um, phone calls, through um, using a lot of the social media, which never is going to never replace the idea of us being together. But we have to see it as the bestness thing. Right, and, and, and it sounds to me like you've already been set up to deliver a lot of programs and services remotely, 
through the mm -hmm. phone calls, the weekly calls. And now it's just been extending the programs out via Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've created other programs to keep people connected, to share information. And We're going to have a cooking show. One of our members who's a chef is going to teach uh, our community how to cook that's awesome. uh, through Zoom. So that's next month. We're going to have our guest uh, from Puerto Rico, actually, who has a, a restaurant, and he offered to teach us how to uh, cook. And we're not sure if he's going to do a dessert, but he's going to do yet. But it's going to be exciting. So we're trying to keep our community engaged. We are also ahead of the game on that aspect because uh, people with HPS is, are very, uh, some of us are pretty immunosuppressed because of medications we're on uh, and or people that have transplants are uh, immunosuppressed because they are on anti and rejection drugs. Or um, I, for example, I am um, uh, being evaluated for lung transplant. My, my lung capacity is okay, but because I know that it's going to happen, I've been taking good care of myself. So things are okay when I really need my transplant. So I have to be extra careful of not getting any major uh, cold or anything that would make my lungs worse. So we are already, we were already practicing that physical distancing, not as extreme as we're doing now, but we were always saying, well, no hugs, let's do the bump. The bump that, you know, the elbow bump, hello, or, you know, the booty bump, hello. And we would create way, creative ways to say, we love you, but in a safe way. That brings me to another aspect that I wanted to uh, touch into, which uh, touch upon, which is, you know, already you've been practicing the physical distancing, um, <clears throat> the working remotely. So, you know, it sounds like, you know, you know, us as people with rare disease and chronic conditions have are set up for success, even if we are coping uh, with the high risk during this time of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about how you've been coping uh, with this uh, time and what, what advice you have for other folks with uh, with either chronic disease or low vision or albinism. You know, how can how can our listeners uh, better cope during this time? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that one of the hardest parts with people who have low vision is our physical distancing because you got to be close to people to know who they are. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you know, you don't want to be talking to a pole. <laughs> you want to make sure you're talking to another person. So it's our nature to get close. It's our nature to try to, you know, to, to get your vision, to get like, okay, let me see, let me read this, let me see who I'm talking to. So for us, it's very, it's like our nature to try to get close. So we ha it's not natural for us to have to mm -hmm. get ourselves two steps back or, or eight feet back and, and, you know, feel comfortable. So it's, it's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. It's an adjustment because this is not our nature. Our nature is to be close to things. So learning that, I think, is going to be hard for, for all of us that have low vision. As I said, we have a little more practice because we have – the underlying physical stuff that make us be aware of that. There's a lot to understand, especially in this time, uh, as we're learning about the virus, as we're learning about how it transmits, but especially for people with chronic illness where the risk is, is even different, it's in a different scale. It's in, a, yes. in the order of magnitude different than, um, than even people with just with low vision um, and all the other things that we have to do as people with low vision. Uh, to get around, but as you said, every time you go outside, every time you go to the supermarket, that clock starts again. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the big things that we have to we have to keep in mind, especially um, as well, we and us, that. we put our phone close to our face, like you know the things you don't think of, things that people don't usually think of. You know, you you take your phone and you walk around, and then you drink your kind of soup, and then you put it in the in the and then somebody calls you and you're like, oh, let me see who that is. And there's your notes in your phone. And then there's, <laughs> you know, all these little things, living things that are in your phone now in your nose. And then they go in your nose and then they get you in your body and then you're done. Maybe maybe switching on voiceover is a good time to, to, yeah. to, to use voiceover. I mean, let I mean, me tell you, the world can learn a lot from people with no vision. 
I gotta say, I think we're teaching the world a lot of these things because we're used to many of these things, as I said, and the people with chronic illness are used to some of these things already. And I think we can teach the world a lot. A lot of the things that are taken for granted by the rest of the world, we've been with it for a while. Exactly, especially uh, thinking about how we work as well. I mean, like right now, right now the table's been completely turned to remote. Yeah, uh, working, working from home, and who better adapt to be working from home using assistive technologies, using your setup? Are people with blindness, low vision, um, people in the disabled communities? Um, now it doesn't matter who who's behind the keyboard. Uh, we can get the job done, and so that's that's been yeah. a big uh, shift in in our way of working. Oh yeah, you know it's funny how people said, "How do you adapt to this time?" And I think that we had adapted pretty well because compared to the rest of the world because we have always to be adapting mm -hmm. we are uh, 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 people with low vision with albinism with hps we have to we've been we've been born adapting you know so we had adapted to everything from the time we were born somehow or another we have to adapt the way we work to school or do our homework or look at the blackboard or mm -hmm. work on the computer or read a book so we are so adaptable people that these times had done what is done is just kind of emphasize how good of out of the box thinker we are that's right we, we are unique problem solvers and mm -hmm. people with disabilities tend to be very unique problem solvers at a uh, very quick adapting to new situations mm -hmm. compared to our you know able-bodied friends basically yeah so in that sense it's as i said it's, it's amazing to see you know I, I when i meet with my people from work they you know it's amazing to see they're talking about the things they're having struggles with and i'm thinking like really <laughs> okay <laughs> but you know it's not to be sound cocky but it is it is funny to see how what is always been your handicap is now your strength. Exactly. You know, exactly. it's it's kind of kind of cool to see. <laughs> Definitely. So Carmen, we're almost running out of time, but I just wanted to get um, what do you think is the future like? Uh, what what's our future going to be looking like, especially um, now after the next couple of months go by? I think, especially for people with. Um, chronic illness, it's going to be a little scary time uh, to go out in the world. Um, for our regular folks, this is also going to be challenging. Um, but we, uh, as you said, we are problem solvers. We are, we adapt. And I think that it's going to take time, but it's going to, it's never going to be the same. I don't think we're ever going to go back to where we were last October. I think that there's going to be things that are going to be are in our heads and they are present in our, you know, everyday living that are going to keep us doing things a little different. Mm -hmm. But I think that we will adapt and we'll get to the point that hopefully science, I, I am a great believer in science. I think science is going to find a way to keep us back at least close to what we were before. And you know some of these things are, are healthy things. It's these things of being worry about germs and worry about con being contagious. And those are things that we need to be anyway sensitive for people with chronic illness anyway, that people kind of take to for granted. So I think people are going to learn those skills a little better. Um, but I I am hopeful that we're going to adapt and whatever comes, we're gonna we're gonna be okay. Wow. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, as always, it's always great uh, speaking with you. I learn a lot. And thank you for the hard work that you're doing, especially in, in, in healthcare and providing much needed services to our community. Uh, and thank you for the work that you and everyone on the team at the HPS Network is doing. Um, it is really shining through uh, the leadership that you guys are bringing to our communities uh, with an albinism, low vision, and with people with chronic disease. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure. And please, anytime, if anyone have any questions, uh, you can give them, you can post my, uh, my um, email address and they can contact me and I'll be more than glad to uh, answer questions. 
Great. We'll definitely do that. Well, this has been another episode of The Hummingbird. Uh, and as Carmen mentioned, um, we are thinking about social distancing is always in our minds, but it's not about um, disconnecting ourselves from our neighbor, from people in our community, rather than um, using physical distancing to protect ourselves, uh, to keep ourselves healthy, but still maintain that connectivity, that connection with our neighbors, with our peers, using technology, being uh, able to adapt and being unique problem solvers. Um, the people with uh, low vision uh, and with chronic disease uh, are unique problem solvers and, and have been able to adapt really quickly to our new normal. And we hope that uh, everyone can, can learn from our communities, uh, especially from the low vision and blindness community, to how, how to adapt quickly. Uh, and live successfully during this new normal. Thank you very much. This show has been brought to you by Sunu, creators of the Sunu Bands uh, Smartwatch, uh, the mobility and navigation tool for people who are blind and low vision. Uh, you can learn more about the Sunu Band at sunu.com. Thank you very much.